Okay, everyone, let's take it away because I think people will drift in faster if we start. Uh, and we've got to keep to schedule. So, uh, this next session uh, is under the rubric of interdisciplinarity. So, one of the wonderful things about CODAL has been that it's brought together people from very different uh, disciplines, learning to speak each other's languages, uh, getting ideas from each other. Uh, so, we've got a couple of uh, showcases there. One of the ones we planned pulled out, which was Hamza Bussi's one on uh, basically psychology and uh, linguistics. But we have two uh, this morning, uh, the second one being sort of split in half on, on the kinship. The, but the first one we have is Catherine Travis, who's been running this magnificent um, Sydney Speaks project, and she's talking about tracking language and social change through the stories people tell. So Okay, so, um, sorry, this might be just I'm seeing one slide before the one that's up there. Um, so Sydney Speaks is a large-scale study of Australian English in which we're looking at language variation and change in its social context. And by that I mean we're considering how lived experiences are reflected in and impact speech patterns. But at the same time, this kind of project allows us to look at how speech patterns provide insights into life in Australia at different time periods and for different demographics. Um, over, over the life of uh, CODAL, we've collected data from 260 Sydney Spark Siders in the form of sociolinguistic interviews and oral histories in which participants still tell stories about their lives, experiences and attitudes. And so altogether we've amassed a corpus of some 130 hours or 1.5 million words of speech that has all been transcribed in prosodic units facilitating linguistic analysis. The data are recorded at two time points with different age groups as are reflected in this chart. Um, the horizontal axis here shows date of birth of the participant. Each participant, each dot is a participant. And on the vertical axis, I've noted the subcorpora that we work with that were collected at different time points. So we're working with some legacy recordings, including the Bicentennial Oral History Project that was recorded in 1988 with elderly people who were born around the turn of the last century. And also working with Barbara Horvath's Sydney Social Dialect Survey that includes adults born in the 1930s and teenagers born in the 1960s. And as part of the, uh, what we call the Sydney Speaks 2010s collection, the contemporary data, for which the collection is still ongoing, we're recording um, adults born in the 1960s and young adults born in the 1990s. Uh, so this gives us overall five different time points and two time periods for tracking change in real and apparent time. We also have different ethnic groups um, capturing some of the ethnic diversity that exists in Sydney. Um, and we have Anglo-Australians there in red, you can see at each of the five time points. Uh, we have Greek and Italian Australians from the 1970s teens and in the 2010s data. And for the 2010s young adults, we have Chinese Australians. And this reflects the migration history of these groups. And I should say that these migrants that we're looking at are second generation migrants. So they were all born in Australia or arrived before the age of five and uh, can be considered native speakers of Australian English. We also have rich met metadata on these participants um, that allows us to do, do things like identify their social class, look at their social networks, look at the degree, the degree to which they orient to their ethnic heritage, which all gives us um, incredible information for interpreting the data that we have. So what I'd like to do today is um, demonstrate some of the associations between patterns of language use and broader social patterns. Um, and I'm going to do this by looking on the one hand at language and societal change, looking at models of obligation and at quotatives, and then also looking at variation and social groupings. 
and I hope to be able to show in this the way linguistic data can contribute to interdisciplinary work looking at the nature of human society. I'll begin with models of obligation. This is some work that I'm currently doing with my colleague Rena Torres Kakoulos, but it was initiated by Renata Plewe and Caroline Cheng as summer scholars in 2017. Modus of obligation are modal verb forms that express the existence of con conditions that compel the referent to carry out an action. And there's a whole range of verbs that are used with this purpose in English. Um, and we'll look at these. I'm going to begin by playing an example, and I'm going to play you some relatively long examples to give you a real feel for the kind of data that we're working with. Um, this is an example from Beatrice, a pseudonym. Um, who was recorded for the Bicentennial Oral History. She was born in 1908 and was recorded at the age of 80. Um, and I've, I've highlighted a couple of the modus of obligation that occur in red. And you'll hear that she's talking about a real um, emphasis here on social decorum, um, which was important at the time and relevant to the change in modus of obligation. And we were allowed to rest during the day. Well, I'm, I'm probably was doing things in the, in the daytime. Uh, because we were told too that if we must be on time for meals. The maids have to produce the meals on time and it's just the courtesy, courteous thing for us to be there to eat them. Now we were taught to be very considerate to the staff. I don't trust Trump or he wouldn't have cared if we had been late, but we were taught that it just wasn't the other thing. If, if you paid somebody to do something and they did it for you, it was up to you to toe the line and appreciate it. So we uh, extracted all modes of obligation in the corpus and we identified five main forms, must, have to, have got to, should and need to. Uh, we exhaustively extracted them from the, the entire uh, five time points across the corpus and then restricted the analysis to the variable context where these five forms exist in alternation with each other, which gave us 1,754 tokens for analysis. Looking first at general change over time in terms of form used, this chart gives the uh, rate of use for each of the five modals, um, and each of the five modals is presented along the horizontal axis. The vertical axis represents the rate, the proportion of the system that that modal represents in the 1970s in red and in the 2010s in green. Um, and uh, we can see that have to and have got to were the majority forms and remain the majority forms with a little bit of movement there. But the, the point that I want to focus on is, oops, sorry, the arrows have shifted, um, drop in must over time and the introduction of need to as a new form in the system. This has been observed across several varieties of English, um, including in Australian English. And it's been tied to a, uh, to a notion of democratisation, where we see a reduction in the authoritative obligation expressed by must and an increase in a notion of personal obligation expressed by need to. For us, a question of interest is whether this is simply a shift in form, simply a reduction, in, a change in forms that express these meanings, or whether, the, whether there's been a larger scale reorganisation of meaning expressed across the system of modals. And in order to assess this, we need to look at the meaning of the different modals. So there's a, a wealth of literature discussing the meaning of modals of obligation, and there's a dizzying array of meanings that have been proposed. People have talked about internal versus, versus external obligation, weak versus strong obligation, um, multiple others. Um, we att attempted to apply these to the data, and none of them really worked for the spontaneous speech data, and so we took a bottom-up approach and went through and coded each example for the meaning that it was expressing, and ended up with a three-way system. The first of which uh, is related to societal norms, as in the examples that we heard, just heard from Beatrice, we must be on time for meals. Included in this are um, things that are hierarchical obligations. So, for example, in this example from Fiona, it's talking about what the teachers require them to do if they're late to school. Or also social expectations, as in the example from Sarah there, who's a Chinese Australian, who says she has to send her kid to tutoring because everybody else is doing it and the kid will get behind. Another meaning relates to general circumstances or consequences. <clears throat> so this is where, this is obligation that's uh, specific to a certain context or situation. As David says, once you're behind, there's a lot of work that you have to do. 
Or also if a, if a because clause is attached, if a reason is attached, as in she has to do it because she has to support her family. And also for rules, for example, in games where there's a procedure that has to be followed. So um, here Mike, a, a 1970s teenager, is talking about a game where they would throw knives at each other's feet. And so you've got to, you've got to throw the knife and you've got to move your foot. Um, and, and here we get a lot of non-specific you associated with this meaning. And then the third meaning that we identify is um, relation to personal opinion. So here, Celeste, high school student saying the teacher should teach us better. This is an, an opinion here. Or a personal choice, as in Katerina saying, I need to be here for my brother's wedding. Um, or giving advice, as in Lewis saying, you need to calm down. So having identified the different meanings, we can then track the change in meaning over time, as well as the change in form over time. So this chart gives the breakdown for each of the five, mean, five modals of these three meanings, first just looking in the 1970s. So the proportion of the data that is made up of societal norms is in light green, the general obligation in uh, darker green, and personal obligation in red. And you can see here that in the 1970s, personal obligation was the primary domain of should and was, in, I mean, it was evident, but it was quite a minority use with all the other modals. In the 2010s, um, we've uh, had little change for should. Um, need to, you can see, comes in with a 57% rate of personal obligation, so quite high. Um, and all, but interestingly, all other modal forms have increased in the proportion of personal obligation. And so this then is evidence of a broader shift in discourse mode from expression of societal norms to a focus more on personal choice associated with a broader social change of diminished importance of interpersonal authority. Sorry, something's gone up with the appears. Um, okay, the next example that I want to talk about is quotatives, and this comes from work that was done by Esther Kim in, for her honours thesis in 2020. So quotatives are forms that are used to introduce quoted speech or thought, and as with the modals, there's a range of verbs that are used with this function. I'll begin with a couple of examples, and again, I've highlighted the um, relevant uh, quotatives there in red. Um, and this is, again, somebody from the Bicentennial Oral History Project, and although she's talking about something that happened 100 years ago, you will feel the familiarity here. A uh, flu epidemic was on, and uh, they had to close the school if the old children were sent home. And Dad turned the school into a hospital. And uh, oh, we were a bit scared of him because uh, he just had to have a white coat on and everything. And when he came home from school, we'd all want to go and kiss him, you know. And Dad would say, keep away, keep away from him. He said, in a minute, and he'd go into, into the bathroom and he'd gargle and straight with brandy. And then he'd have a wash up, and then it was all right. We were allowed to, to talk to him. Also some nice information about sort of remedies and home ideas about what to do. They have also come back to some different. So this next example is from a 2010s young adult, uh, Craig, who's a diesel mechanic. And here he's talking about an interaction he had when he was looking in a window at some real estate. And I remember standing there looking at it and they're like, that was a bit of a smart ass. And I just remember, like, they're like, oh, don't be looking there, pal, you'll never afford it. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, fair, fair enough. And I always remember that, I'm like, yeah. I just wanted to flog them, but I was like, nah. <laughs> so again, we extracted all quotatives from the, the entirety of the corpus um, and wrote them down into six main forms. Say, be like, go, think, a zero or a bear form. and a, a small set of other verbs that we collapsed gives a total of um, over 5,000 tokens this time for analysis. So here's the, the change that we see over time, this time with each of the six quotatives along the horizontal axis and the vertical axis again represents the proportion of the quotative system that that particular quotative represents, 1970s in red, 2010s in green. And you can see that in the 2010s, the system was very much dominated by say, which accounted for 60% of all quotatives, with no other quotative reaching 20%. This has um, dropped 
a lot for the 2010s. It, it now has come down to the level of, of some of the other quotatives. Um, and be like has increased, has come in as a new major form. Again, this parallels change that's been reported elsewhere for the English-speaking world and has also been reported for Australian English. And this too has been tied to a shift in discourse mode where we've moved from reporting events to reporting more internal experience. So in order to assess, assess whether this too is primarily due to the introduction of one form or whether it's a broader change across the system, we looked at uh, different quote types and the literature on quotatives has made a broad two-way distinction, which applies well in the data, between direct speech and internal dialogue. So direct speech is like most of the examples that we just heard, where a person is reporting or saying something that represents what somebody said. Maybe not an exact rendition, but that's the idea. In internal dialogue, which we see in one of the examples from Craig, where he says, I just wanted to flood him, but I was like, no. This is more of a reaction rather than what he actually said. Or hear from Annette. I was a little girl, I was like, woo -hoo. Okay. So um, again, we can track the distribution of these different functions over time. So this chart shows for each of the six quotatives the proportion of the time that they're used for direct speech in dark green, oh, sorry, in light green, and internal dialogue in dark green. And you can see that in the 1970s, internal dialogue was pretty much reserved for think. It was categorical thinking and no other form was basically used with this meaning. For the 2010s, think remains categorically internal dialogue. And um, say, there right on the left, still has very minimal use of internal dialogue. Uh, be like, the new form that's come in over on the right, is used for internal dialogue about 40% of the time. And for all other quotatives, um, although the, the proportion varies, we have seen an increase from the 1970s to the 2010s in the proportion with which they're used for internal dialogue. So this has been interpreted as the emergence of self-revelation as a discourse mode uh, by Alexander Darcy, and the Bob has talked about the growth of a more expressive style as children are encouraged to be in touch with their emotions and let significant others know how they feel about them. So to summarise what we've seen so far in terms of language and societal change, we, um, again, I think useful to, to turn to a quote from Le Bob where he talked about language change being change in what is most likely to be done with the new tools that the evolving language has to offer. In this case, the new tools that we're looking at are need to, and its expression of personal obligation, and be like, and its expression of internal states, but we're seeing that the introduction of these new tools beyond the new tools themselves have uh, implemented a broader change across the system uh, in both modes and uh, quotatives. And specifically, we can tie this to the kind of societal change that people have talked about and interpret this perhaps as a linguistic man manifestation of broader societal change related to democratisation and value of self-revelation. So the third variable that I want to look at is ing, um, and this differs from what we saw for the modals and the quotatives because this is a case of a stable variable rather than something undergoing change. So we find that variation between in and ing has existed for hundreds of years across the English-speaking world with the non-standard vernacular in variant favoured in casual speech by men and by people of lower socioeconomic status. Um, and this was also found to be the case in Australia in work in the 1970s and 80s, but this variable hadn't been looked at again in Australian English until we started looking at it. So here I'm not tracking change over time, instead I'm looking at patterns of variation to give insight into different communities. So to do this, I'm going to look at four different time points. Um, we haven't yet coded the bicentennial data for ING, so I can't tell you what they're doing. Um, but I will tell you about these four age groups, and we're looking at the ethnic communities here as well. So we're looking at Anglo-Australians for four time points, Italian-Australians for three, and then Chinese-Australians for the youngest set of data. So again, I'll begin with some examples. Um, here's Hugh, who was an adult recorded in the 1970s, um, and here he's talking about a danger of death experience, and you'll hear that he produces uh, consistently the standard in form. 
And I was then again thinking, oh, it looks as though I'll be killed uh, because the car is still rolling and goodness knows what's happened, but I can't remember feeling fear. Uh, and here's Fabio, who's an Italian adult who was recorded in the 2010s. Um, here he's talking about trying to find an Italian school for his daughter. Um, and you hear his, you'll hear he's got some variability in his in realizations. It's getting harder and harder to find one sort of local, so you can have a field and then uh, start to go to the Concord. So it became hard to get to. And last example of, for this is um, Emma, who's a young adult Anglo-Australian, um, also with some variability in her speech. Like, you were driving down the road and there's someone walking for the park and they wave and you wave and keep going. Okay, so we went through and we uh, extracted and coded all instances of in in the data, which gave us a very large number of tokens, over 10,000 tokens of this, um, with an overall rate of 18% in, which is substantially lower from rates that are typically reported from the, from the UK and the US as a point of interest. So here um, I want to look at the class distribution as this has been a variable that's known to be well class stratified and we can see that that applies most definitely in Australia too. So this chart gives the each of the four age groups along the horizontal axis. Again, the vertical axis is the rate of the variant, in this case, the rate of the vernacular variant. So the higher the bar, the more the non-standard in form. And the different colors here represent class. And what we can see here is that the class stratification holds over time. So rates of in are highest for the working class, followed by the lower middle class, and then the upper middle class. Um, and, and, and this is relative, there's some, some tweaks there, but this is basically held over time. Not shown here, uh, but we also have a favouring of in for males over females. Comparing overall the rates of use over time, we see here that the highest rate is by the 1970s teens. Um, and rather than interpreting this as change in apparent time, it appears more likely to be due to an adolescent peak where adolescents increase their rate, have a high rate of non-standard or vernacular forms um, as part of their general uh, rebelling against society and they also do this in, in their use of, uh, norms, of norms of standard speech. Um, which, which itself is very interesting for the relationship between language and society but not what I'm focusing on here. Beyond that, we do see relative stability in rates of use over time, consistent with the long-standing stability of this variable. So what I do want to focus on is the ethnic differentiation, which is illustrated in this chart, where I've collapsed the three class groups for the Anglos, and I've added in the Italians in the darker green and the Chinese in light green. So looking first at the Italian Australians, we see that for the 1970s teenagers, they're very similar to the Anglo-Australians. But for the 2010s adults, they're not because while the Anglos showed a very sharp drop-off of the vernacular rate, the Italian adults retain the relatively high vernacular rate of the teenagers. In order to interpret this, we need to understand a little bit more about the community. So these adults are the children of post-World War II migrants primarily, which was a very working class community. And although we've seen considerable mobility of this group, seen particularly in levels of home ownership, their community, their networks remain very much embedded in the Italian community. And we know this from the demographic data that we've collected and also from the recounts that they give in their interviews. And so this would seem to indicate that uh, the, Italian, the Italian adults are not operating in the same linguistic marketplace as Anglo-Australians and aren't subscribing to the same hegemonic norms. This is no longer the case for the young adults who drop drastically in their rate of the vernacular variants. And when we look at their networks, we find that their networks are more diverse, much more embedded in the mainstream community socially, and that's what we see also linguistically. And I'll also note that the Italian Australians show very similar class and gender stratification to the Anglo Australians. And one half of the Anglo young adults are university students, and that's possibly lowering even further the rate that we see here. For the Chinese Australians, they have the lowest vernacular rate overall, and they also have very little class or gender stratification in contrast to the Italian and the Anglo-Australians. 
So for this group, we see a general avoidance of the vernacular form across the community. And this is consistent with what we've seen for, across a range of variables in Sydney Speaks, which suggests a kind of hypersensitivity to norms of overt prestige. This is entirely consistent with the socioeconomic status of this community, which are second generation Chinese, Australians and Cantonese background. Um, and from census data and from reports on the community, we know that they tend to be highly educated, uh, they tend to work in white collar professions and attend selective high schools. And this also emerges in the, in the data, in the interviews, where we can see the importance of the networks that they gain at these selective schools. So I'm going to play you one final example from a Chinese Australian talking about these networks and the selective schools. The people you meet who are from selective backgrounds are very smart, they're very capable, they're very hardworking. And like, I think I have an amazing network because like, the people I know from they are off doing amazing stuff. And like, I will now have like, all these people who are like, at the top of their careers, um, doing all this crazy stuff, and I know them, and I can connect with them. So this is what we're also seeing in their speech, this very middle class orientation. So to summarize then, um, we have seen here that the stories that people tell provide us a great linguistic data for analysis, but at the same time, they can afford terrific um, socio-demographic insights, um, allowing us to situate linguistic phenomena within broader social patterns and draw connections between language use and social values and structures. Uh, before leaping to draw sort of direct conclusions about uh, social values and structures and change based on linguistic data, I think it's worthwhile remembering um, Michael's word of caution that we must be very patient about accumulating a large amount of data from a variety of languages, genres and disciplines. But I hope to have shown you the value of including linguistic work in interdisciplinary studies of human society and that in order to be able to do that, we need um, a, a gold standard of sociolinguistic work involving substantial collections of spontaneous speech data, which provide the collective wisdom of the participants about their community engagement, etc., um, and associated metadata to be able to interpret that. So, thank you very much. And I would also like to thank and acknowledge the Very Large Sydney Speaks team who's been involved over the course of CODAL in putting together this large corpus. And in particular today, I would like to highlight my students who I believe are here. Eleanor, Gunn, Heba and Marcel, who have talked about many of these ideas with me and helped me work in putting this presentation together. So thank you. Thank you uh, I think we've got time for one question. Alan. Oh good. Uh, I'm very excited. Um, yeah, this is a fascinating stuff and especially, I mean, it, it connects well with the results of uh, sociology. So the um, the step on, on obligation is especially interesting in connection with the rise of neoliberalism and that kind of ideology. But there's just one thing that I wanted to ask you about a, a matter of data. Alongside the, the need to, the tremendous rise of need to, there's also I need you to. Did, did you look at that? Uh, is that you parked over there? If so, I need you to move your car. Like yeah, no, we had very little of that, actually. I don't, I don't know if that occurred at all. Actually. Maybe it's more true of, of North America. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's true. Um, yes, I, I wonder if that's the same kind of process. Actually, that's an interesting one because that seems to me it's, it's the, the variation there is not, it, it wouldn't be part of the variable context actually because, because it, it um, well, it's, it's very opens different. Up to, yeah, um, and it seems to me that it's a way of offering an, a, 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 not using an imperative, but quite a command. Yeah. You know, I need you to do this. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that didn't arise. That's an interesting one. Very sorry, I'm going to have to cut questions off. Uh, present and the title is very suitable for Sydney Speaks in the time of our lives. Of course, this yeah. is what uh, we've been listening to, and it, it raises so many um, echoes of, of different generations. So thanks for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Sort of double bracket on kinship, and first off is Steve Levinson.
who's been our wonderful uh, partner investigator uh, from Max Planck Institute of Psycholinguistics and who's formed so much of how we think about lots of the questions in COVID. Thank you, Steve, for coming all the way from England to be here. Actually, it's a real pleasure to be here. I have to say, I have a sort of triumphal exit of the centre. And I think I can say, uh, you know, relatively objectively, as uh, an external partner, that um, this really has been a beacon uh, on a worldwide uh, basis for the language sciences. Uh, so congratulations to you all. I right? uh, really, uh, uh, and, and what we are hearing, of course, today, uh, and we'll continue over the uh, uh, tomorrow anyway. Uh, it, a, a lot of the individual achievements of the, of the project, but I think also tremendously important, you have trained a whole new generation of excellent young scholars. So um, congratulations to you all. You should all, you know, rise and take a bow. <laughs> but um, uh, and I do, do want to just mention uh, uh, the three women who's, uh, at least by legend, um, cooked up the idea. Uh, so uh, Jane Simpson, Jill Rick Wigglesworth, and uh, my own uh, uh, colleague, the late Anne Cutler. Um, I think that you know, congratulations to you. I think for the, having the scale of ambition uh, to put this all together, and um, and then I do want to mention the inspirational leadership uh, of Jane and Nick that has made the whole thing so successful. I deviate though from what I should be doing. Uh, which is uh, talking. Um, oh no, I'm going backwards. The green button.
any of us who struggle with the kinship system of another society are aware of the sheer complexity of kinship systems. Um, and I think what better way to understand and study that than to uh, look at how kids learn kinship and the difficulties they have. Now, there's a hundred years of uh, work here, starting with Piaget, um, and who pointed out that kids pass through a set of stages when learning about kinship, that they first of all think that you know, uncle is a name, and then they come to realize that we've got more than one uncle, so it's a category, uh, and, then, um, uh, and then they come to realize, actually, no, it's a relationship. I have an uncle, and he's, and then only later, realize the reciprocal relationship uh, that he's got a nephew and so on. So the set of, uh, um, of uh, stages that kids go through. And you can see it's relatively very late learn. We're talking about middle and late childhood. That is for that was for Genevan kids, uh, people working on American kids, and basically ratified showing that this is generally the right sort of picture. However, well, first of all, let me just say something about why these terms are difficult. Why, it's under, why, why is it such a barrier to children understanding kinship? Partly, I think it's that the terms are didactic terms. Didactic terms, let's say, I've got a brother, um, but it's not necessarily your brother, right? Uh, and uh, so the, the relativity of the terms. Secondly, they're relational, uh, and relational concepts are difficult for children. And so Piaget also show that uh, the notion like larger than is also difficult uh, for children. Um, and then they, the categories involved, like auntie, are kind of unnatural categories. So uh, uh, and then on top of all that, the whole system is a recursive system. Uh, so you can go on and on talking about great, 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 great uh, 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 uncles and so on. So all of those are the difficulties. Now, more recent uh, cross-cultural work shows that I think that these uh, Western findings are a little bit uh, um, wrong because we're looking at this sort of atrophy kinship system. And you look at societies where the uh, kinship still plays a critical role, um, uh, then you do get a different sort of picture. And uh, a very nice study by Joe Bly and associates on Murunpata that uh, shows that kids have a very good understanding of kinship uh, rather early than the Piaget results, for example. Now, um, I would though like to take you to a society where um, kinship really dominates uh, the political uh, and, uh, sphere and all of the spheres because the state is relatively in abeyance. Um, and so I'll take you out to this island in the middle of the Coral Sea, Russell Island, uh, which is uh, closer to us here uh, in Canberra than Darwin, for example. It's a local island, really. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, let's just uh, have a quick look at that kinship system. Now, I, it's a complex system, and I won't uh, expect you to understand the system at all, really, except I, I, those of you familiar with um, crow systems will see this is actually a crow system. You could adopt this uh, a collapse of the terms across generations um, uh, in a, uh, a directional way that is very uh, 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 typical of matrilineal systems, but it's odd, it's a pretty odd system because you can see I've got a brother uh, two generations up, so wo means brother, uh, so I've got a brother of my generation of course, and then I've got a brother two generations up and another two generations down. That kind of discontinuity is one it should be challenging for kids. Um, and uh, so we have uh, done some investigations here, looking at about 70 kids from six up. We should have started earlier, but we didn't realize how, how incredibly good they are at this. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and, but what we can say is that from the age of six, uh, they really uh, have grasped the essentials of kinship so far earlier than these uh, Piagetian results would have suggested. Um, and they can recite, they just do have no, a lot of that. They can recite their lineal ancestors up to, uh, you know, 11 generations deep, uh, which is something which is really staggering. Uh, um, uh, but, um, uh, and they also know a lot about the, uh, the, uh, the, the ethical uh, uh, side of kinship and about the, the proper um, uh, demeanor and so on that you have with the different kind of relatives. Curiously, they, you know, you can ask a six-year-old who you can and can't marry, and 
they can correctly <laughs> tell you. Um, so, uh, also, kids show a, a, a surprising ability to, to calculate kinship. So, it's that side of it that I just want to spend a, a few uh, minutes on telling you a little bit about uh, how early they can do some kinship reasoning. One of the more remarkably difficult aspects of kinship. So, um, so we tested this in a couple of ways, um, and this is very, uh, this was very kind of uh, school-like uh, testing. So it, it, it requires a certain amount of meta uh, cognition to be able to answer these kind of questions. Because we were asking questions like, you know, what is a mother's brother's son to you? What category? Uh, and expecting them to answer, you know, a cousin. Right. So it's quite, quite difficult to give a kin, kin type string, as we say in the trade, to generate the, uh, the correct term. Uh, and uh, so in the local language, we were asking things like, you know, father's cross sex siblings, female child is a what to you? <laughs> Rather <laughs> difficult sort of questions. So that would be, um, so the answer we get would be a uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so it's that kind of a relationship. And then, in many questions later, uh, we were asking a, a question like this, father's father's cross-sex sibling is a what to you? So this is um, uh, one of the case of this kind of generational collapse, and again, the correct answer is a car, yeah. And so on and so forth, we asked about the different uh, kinds of brothers, uh, um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and here are the uh, results. Each dot here is a kid, uh, and we can see the ages here on the bottom there. Um, and uh, um, and what, what I think you've just get an immediate impression, it's, it's pretty uh, remarkable really. So on, on average, we, they've got, got, got these questions uh, correct about 70% about of the time. And, um, and you can see they get better with age, but they, they're already uh, very competent at these very I think you have to confess that in difficult questions we even find, uh, I can, uh, as adults, do, doing this sort of thing in English. Okay, so uh, we also looked at a more difficult kind of um, a, a kinship reasoning, which is actually uh, separated from, so that, that, that was exploiting an underlying uh, kindred, uh, uh, this network uh, that we have. Uh, but you, there's also a, uh, a logic of categories. So this is like asking in English, um, if he's a nephew to dad, what is he to you? Right? Um, and the answer would be, a cousin, but uh, that's not that easy. Uh, so, so this is devoid of the um, uh, of the specifics of the genealogy because of different kinds of nephews. So that's uh, um, uh, uh, a brother or sister, uh, but um, but it, but it but it has to do with the underlying re relational logic between the terms. So we tried this too, um, and there are indeed rules of a kind that you can. Uh, exploit. So, in, uh, for for the uh, locals, there's a rule of the kind: if somebody is, uh, if someone is dad's grandchild, then he's a brother for me. They know that, uh, and so uh, it doesn't matter what kind of a grandchild. So, all of these are, uh, are different kinds of grandchilds, uh, but they're going to be brothers for me. So, um, so then we 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 asked them. So we said, imagine you're on your way to get a newel. And, uh, and, and Dad calls out, um, uh, my grandchild. Now what are you going to call out to? Uh, uh, and, and so on. So we tried to uh, make it. Anyway, um, I won't go through the, um, the details here. I'll just say that we tested many different um, uh, kinds of uh, um, relations where there were multiple possible genealogical connections uh, to see whether they understood uh, the underlying reason. Well, I went sober with this, uh, and, but I think this is not surprising because I, 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 it is a very sort of school book uh, testing uh, situation that they were in. <laughs> but you can see, which is interesting, is that a lot of kids are at ceiling, that's right up the top there. Um, and some of them perhaps didn't quite get the task, but overall, uh, they're still at um, about, correct, about 60% of the time. So, um, I think the, the, the point of this is simply that in cases where kinship really plays a critical role, kids are much more advanced than uh, the um, 
Piaget in analysis would suggest. Um, and, uh, and they can overcome the, uh, the cognitive complexities of kinship uh, reasoning. So, um, and, and they also know a lot about the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the rights and duties that pertain uh, to all of these uh, kinship relations. Now, for all of these systems, when one sort of boggles at the complexity, and you know, have to ask him why are kinship systems are complex, and of course the answer is they are dealing with all of the local social structural needs of the, of the system. And in this particular case, it's complex because of the cross cutting it's actually a covertly dual descent system, uh, and um, because the clan membership goes through the metro line, but land, the critical uh, kind of capital, goes through the patriline. And so tracking all of this is, the, um, uh, uh, is quite tricky. And the system is organized around that and doing all of the normal things that kinship uh, systems do. But that just brings me to point out, you know, if you think about the subsection systems of this continent, um, and the complexities which have boggled mathematical anthropologists uh, for ever since they were uh, brought to the attention of scientists. And um, these are some of the great intellectual achievements of um, uh, uh, pre-literate uh, civilizations, I think. And uh, it's good for us to just realize that the complexities are, are stunning. And, um, and, and here we're dealing with this, these wonderful examples of design without a designer, uh, prime examples then of cultural evolution. No inventor, but collective genius over generations. And, uh, and then, you know, one can go on and ask, you know, uh, the many kinds of questions about how many types of systems there are here, um, and, uh, um, and how they, those systems are kind of uh, uh, um, fitted to the local uh, needs of, uh, of the social systems. Questions that uh, may, have, may or may not have time to pick up on. Um, but um, uh, I think the, the, one of the points is simply that this, it, it, the kinship systems are like model organisms. If you're interested in cultural evolution, you can just see these are, are wonderful things to study. Specifically for the language sciences, uh, kinship plays a cause of critical role in many of the societies we happen to work in, uh, like the one I just uh, uh, showed you in, on Russell Island. Uh, but more important is just that, they, that, uh, that these systems are microcosms of, uh, with a social, cognitive, linguistic nexus where all of these things come together to, um, uh, in a very interesting way. So, uh, and so they have, of course, a, a lot of the cognitive complexity of languages with their com com uh, recursive relational system. Uh, and, um, and then they have this, uh, this property being worked on just by languages, by cultural evolution, to produce these beautiful working systems. Um, a third, I think, interest, of course, for kinship is it offers important insights into the evolution of human nature, human society. And, and you can wonder about you know, how we modified the great ape background to end up where we have ended up. Here, um, so I turn now briefly to the kind of primal origins of kinship. Here, if Kim Sterelny was here, um, uh, he would wax eloquent. Uh, I will reduce this to a single slide, but, um, but uh, but this uh, uh, is a very interesting question. You know, how did we modify that great ape background to produce human kinship? And um, and when you look at the chimpanzees, who are our nearest relatives, a reasonable sort of base to think that we might have started from, uh, then you can see we have a long way to go because uh, with chimpanzees, where females disperse, uh, gives one then a small chance of extended maternal uh, reckoning. Um, and so you've got basically very restricted, um, you, siblings know who, who they are, but uh, not much beyond that. Uh, and so very restricted uh, uh, kinship systems, um, as you know, in, in the 
chimpanzees. So to get human kinship, you need to do a lot of work. You have to, first of all, uh, have pair bonding, which will give you um, the possibility of uh, ascribing paternity <laughs> to, to, to somebody. Uh, and, uh, and then that, of course, will give, allow the recognition of bilateral kindreds. And then with bilateral kindreds, uh, you, if you can maintain knowledge of bilateral kindreds across groups, now you're getting into the sort of human domain. And then, of course, you've got the whole, all the moral dimensions, the ethical dimensions uh, uh, that go with uh, uh, kinship. Uh, categories. So you've got a long way to go. And I think that what one has to appreciate is that to, to handle all of this, there has had to have been a cognitive revolution. Uh, you had to have the memory uh, to handle these bilateral networks. You had to have the, um, the, the these ability to handle these kind of unnatural categories. Uh, and then the recursive reasoning uh, that, it, it, that uh, uh, based on those, um, uh, and the relational reasoning, which is the fundament of, of, of this, uh, and which great apes had very restricted abilities to reason relationally. And I think it's important to have shown that, that uh, kinship reckoning and reasoning is earlier, much earlier, potentially, in societies where uh, kinship still plays a, a dominant role. It's important for the following speculation. Uh, which is um, whether you know, human kinship may not have provided actually the historical cognitive basis for language rather than the other way around. We tend to think it's the other way around. We need the language to produce complex uh, human kinship. But it may have been that these kind of mini grammars were actually the bridge to language. So thank you very much. I uh, end with this. <laughs> <laughs> So just before going on to my own uh, presentation, I just wanted to mention, you might have seen in the earlier versions of this program, it was called Philosophy Meets Kinship. And something that happened inside the center was in talking to philosophers uh, like Kim Sterelny, uh, it turned out that with all of their interest in emergent language and so on, they basically weren't thinking about kinship. That was something for anthropologists and linguists and others to do. So we organized a workshop on the evolution of kinship that related to Kim Sterling's own interests in the way that evolution of particular social uh, properties may have driven the emergence of language. And some of the uh, work that Steve was talking about came out of that workshop and was published in a special 2021 journal issue. So I'll just pass on to my own talk now which will dive into some more details. And one of the things that we've done through the course of CODAL is build up some pretty massive uh, databases, uh, trying to put together data on languages from around the world. We think there's about 7,000 languages around the world. There's a lot of questions that we would like to answer against that knowledge base. We haven't got all 7,000 in, but we're getting up to around 1,000, a bit over 1,000 for uh, some of the debate data as we've got, and we worked in very closely with the Max Planck Institute for, the, for Evolutionary Anthropology, as it now is in Leipzig, uh, and there's something called uh, Gotterbank, which has a number of sub-banks, including Grand Bank, that Hedvig here has been very involved in. Uh, and then uh, we developed a thing called KinBank, which was a sort of merger of something growing out of Parabank, which was another one of the databases we developed here with a project led by Fiona Jordan in, um, in the UK. There she is, second from the right, and Sam Parsonal, who's also here today, um, called Verikin. So uh, a lot of things that allow us to build things on a scale we couldn't have done otherwise. And that's what I'm wanting to talk about now, some of the, or one particular insight that's come out of that. So kinship. Um, it's a very precise tool, as Steve showed us, for understanding uh, conceptual differences. And if we think that each language builds its own conceptual units, we want to ask of any domain of language, colour or, or whatever it might be, um, 
what's the same and what's different. It's a naive thing that we think when we learn another language, we're just taking words and pinning them onto the same concepts that we already have. So maybe we learn French and we say, okay, what's son, fils, what's daughter, fee. Yes, the pronunciation is different, but the, the concept is basically identical. Uh, so we can think that, uh, and if you go between two, two languages like English and French, basically you have the same conceptual system, despite the the words being different. Except in French you have to distinguish the gender of cousin, 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 just like we have to distinguish the distinction between brother and sister, or son and daughter, and so on. And it's easy to maintain that illusion. For a long time what linguistics did was just look at lots and lots of languages, you know, let's say English, Dutch, uh, so English, German, Dutch, French, Italian, Spanish, Ukrainian, on you can go. Uh, and if you've got two brothers, you call them two brothers, or it's one little, or whatever it is. If it's brother and sister, brother and sister, little and schwester, or whatever. If it's two sisters, two sisters, two schwestern. You could easily think that's how the world is. We have brothers and sisters, or we have mothers and fathers, or uncles and aunts, or whatever. But when we look a bit further afield, we find that things don't always work like that. It's much more interesting. So. Just resting ourselves to two sibling terms to start with, uh, in Bilwa and some other languages in this part of the world, so Bilwa from the Solomon Islands, it's an upper language, you have two terms, just like in English, but Tamania is, uh, if you're a man, it's your brother, if you're a woman, it's your sister. So it's your opposite sex sibling category that Steve mentioned. Uh, and then some is your same sex sibling. So if you're a man, uh, it's, uh, oh sorry, it's the other way around. Uh, Tamania was the same, man's brother, uh, woman's sister, and Sunday is the other. Now, go to Indonesian, another language in our part of the world. Kaka is your older sibling, Adi is your younger sibling. You don't care about it. Japanese, you cross relative age with the gender of the referent. So you've got Ani or Ani-san for the older brother, Ani, Ani-san for older sister, and so on. Things don't end there, because there's lots of possible combinations. If we factorise into the sex of the referent, the sex of the speaker or the anchor point, and the older, younger distinction, we're throwing away some fine grain things there, but this will get us a long way. There's lots and lots of ways of uh, cutting up the cake, some of them shown uh, there. In fact, there's 4,140 possible ways as long as we just confine ourselves to siblings, which are a tiny part of the overall kinship system. Uh, there was an early paper by Nurlov and Romney that surveyed 245 languages, which is a big sample for them. Interestingly, they, they found only 23 uh, systems. So they didn't find 245 systems. There is diversity, but it's not like every possible thing. Like you don't take things which don't share some feature in common and put them together in general. So if we multiply this out, if we think all of those points on the genealogy, going right up to your father's father and your father's mother, and we are interested in all of those, we take the terms that are spread across them because they show you what the categories are uh, in a language. So in English, my grandfather is both my father's father and my mother's father. So we should treat father's father and father's mother as potentially different and observe grandfather covers both of them. That's a huge domain of data because each data point can have a term in a language that might stray across to another data point. So work on this has been going on since the 19th century. Uh, Morgan is uh, amazing survey and then in Australian people uh, looked at stuff like that, people like Howard and so on. Uh, but uh, the question is you get overwhelmed with data. If you've got hundreds of types and for each type you say, well, which other types is the same as we already saw it was hard enough with siblings. Once we get right up, it becomes impossible to compute. And one response among anthropologists in particular was the essentialist route to say let's find the sweet spot or the most informative spot if we can find what's happening with parents and 
and uncles, you know, uncles and aunts, that will give us a pretty good clue about what's happening everywhere else. So if my father's brother is called by the same term as my father, that's something that happens in many Australian systems, then by applying reasoning, the son of my father's father, who's really the son of my father, will be my brother. So then my cousin, my, what we call a parallel cousin, my father's brother's son, will be just a brother. So get, just pick your uncles and aunts and parents and you'll be able to predict a lot more. So that underlied a uh, whole lot of work in anthropology on types of system, and there was a presumption that that predictiveness was there. But there's a problem with that. One problem is it's a bit arbitrary. So if we're just looking in that generation, it's leaving out crucial information about others. I might be comparing my brother to my cousins, but why not also be saying, well, what about my brother and my grandfather? We already heard from Steve about things like happening with this group and plot. Well, in Kaida, for example, my gunkul, uh, which is my father's father, I can use the word damuju, which is a man's older brother, to refer to my father's father. And he can refer back to me as Duji, which is a man's younger brother, because I'm like his younger brother, and then down to the next generation. Uh, I'll skip B because we've sort of heard about that from Steve, but then C's also interesting because you can take terms that double up between uh, things like your uncle and aunt, which are consanguineal kin, blood kin, and in-law terms like father-in-law. So in uh, Kaido, for example, my father-in-law, who I call Garu, uh, which is a term for my sister's child also, and he calls me Kapuju, which means my maternal uncle. I'll have a look at that at the moment. So if we just decide that we're not looking at that, we're just looking at uncles and aunts and cousins, we miss out on that. Who's to say this is a less important feature of the kinship system? So uh, we want a way of making these things computationally tractable. We are talking about comparing hundreds of kin types with each other kin type and seeing whether they have the same term or not. And we can just take each type, ask is it the same or not? So for example, in English, is a man's older brother the same as a man's younger brother? Yes, they're both brothers. Okay, yes, give it a one. In Indonesian, is a man's older brother, kaka, the same as a man's younger brother, adik, no, give a zero. So we can produce a string of ones and zeros and turn our meeting uh, patterns into something that becomes computationally tractable. And we can also do that comparing systems to one another. So interestingly, English is called an Eskimo system, uh, with apologies to poor Eskimos who that, like that term, but it's just become entrenched in the literature. And Iro Iroquois system is also sometimes called a Dravidian system, or it's a typical system in many parts of Australia. And you could say, well, what's similar, what's different? Well, in both of them, you know, my brother uh, is uh, so and the same. There's certain types of cousins that are distinct, other types of cousins which are kept distinct in English, uh, which uh, are treated as brothers or sisters in Iroquois, Dravidian, most Australian systems, and so on. So we can, uh, again, assign numbers to those equations. So then we can make all the comparisons we want, but to do it, we get into the territory of some very vast uh, numbers. Because uh, if we think what we're doing is comparing the numbers of ways we can partition a space that has, let's say, round about 100 terms, we, we've already pruned off great grandparents or great uncles and great aunts using a so-called tidy little data set of about 100. Uh, but then if we just say that, how many partitions are there? There's a thing called a bell number, which tells you how many ways you can partition, and that is 5.5, 5 times 10 to the power 112. You can find metaphors for how big that is, but it's just unthinkably enormous, right? It takes a lot of computer time to work it out. So, how does that uh, then bear up to scrutiny? We can ask questions like, 
do uncle and aunt and pair terms predict what's happening with cousin and sibling terms and this is from a paper that that same group that I showed uh, earlier on, this is the Pasma et al. Uh, paper, uh, 2021, uh, put together, and Wolfgang Barth did these calculations inside that paper. So we've got on one dimension what's happening in uncles, aunts, uh, and parents, and on the other generation what's happening with siblings and cousins. If everything uh, went well, that is the one predicted the other, everything should be in those diagonal cells because those are the sort of harmonic cells which are behaving properly on both dimensions. And you see, well, it sort of works, but there are some other cells which are pretty populous, like the uh, one down the bottom right uh, and the one at, uh, which has, uh, behaves in a so-called Sudanese system, so you distinguish all types of cousin uh, in, in one way, uh, and uh, all types of uncle and aunt in the other way. Things just don't uh, line up particularly well. So the classic typologies, they're approximations, they tell you about tendencies, but they don't tell you how things have to be. So if that's the case, then we should go back and start looking at things in a less essentializing way. And we proposed in that paper that we need to have a root and branch review of these types and maybe just get away from those types. They're not helping us understand. And now we've got new methods of data aggregation, computational methods for looking at them. We can have a more accurate and flexible description of how we carve up the social world. And we can zero in on different things. And, uh, open up what we could call the coupling question, that is, does something that happens in one part of the system impact on another part of the system? Linguists have long had a motto that language is a system where everything hangs together. Is that really true? Uh, we can look at that. So we build a database and we can compute over all those things at once. That's what Kinban does. Now I want to look at a particular uh, question which isn't part of those uh, classic debates, but people who've worked on Australian languages regularly encounter. So here's something from a, it's actually a school book for teaching people. It's called Discovering uh, Australian or Aboriginal Kinship uh, by Don Williams, but based on work by Warner in Northeast Arnhem Land in the 1930s. And so this is from Lupa Puinum. And if you go up to the parents' generation, your mother, but also your mother's sister, uh, Nabi, and your mother's brother is Napipi. Your father is Bapa, so is your father's brother, but your father's sister is Bapa Mupu. So that's fairly standard. But now, what do they call you? I can be a, a boy or a girl, doesn't matter. My father, my father's brother, and my father's sister all call me Gato. And my mother, my mother's sister, and my mother's brother all call me Waku. Now just think of how you would translate that. Gatu in English can mean son, it can mean daughter, it can mean nephew, or it can mean niece. And same for Waku. And if we go in the other direction, it also doesn't translate well. That's very different from what we saw with sister and brother or going between English and French kinship systems. Essentially what's going on is that we've got something which tracks descent through the male line, so a man or his brother or sister, and another one that tracks descent through the female line. Well, how common is that? Uh, first of all, let's just step back. <coughs> this is a system that runs pretty deep. There's a lot of ways of talking about it. So it's not just an accident of words for brother and sister, or and uh, uncle and aunt. So in Bin Gunwok, for example, there's a verb, bonam, which literally means to engender patrilineally or engender through the male line. And there's another verb, yaoman, which means to engender matrilineally or through the female line. Ilda and yaru, yaru, uh, Iwaja have similar uh, verbs. My yaru and wula. So in Iwaja, I can call my father, my father's sister, my father's brother, and my yaru, literally the one who engendered me through the male line. 
And if you look at sign systems, we have these very interesting signs. This is another thing that grew out of work by uh, a number of COBOL uh, members, including uh, Jenny Green, on uh, sign for various things, including sign for kin. This is from uh, Burrata, Kukunakta, language around Managrita. So uh, this particular uh, sign is used both for the mother, but also a woman's child. So it's a reciprocal relationship, self-reciprocal relationship. And this sign touching here, some, in other languages it sometimes goes up to here, is for either a father or a man's child or an auntie, that is a father's sister, who is like a female father, that is through that line. Okay, so there's a whole lot of indications that these are important things, uh, important groupings. Well, we can go back into KinBank uh, and see in a minute how um, widespread they are worldwide. But before doing that, let's just look at why you might get this. Steve already showed us that in, on Russell Island, you get descent through uh, two lineages, male and female. And in Australia, you also get this sort of juggling with two lineages simultaneously. So there on the left, we have uh, patra clans, which run down vertically. They're land-holding units, language-transmitting units, and so on. And matra lineages uh, going down uh, diagonally, which are spouse-giving lineages. So if you want to know who to marry, you have to calculate the matra lineage in the Yulma region. And uh, skin terms or subsection terms that are found over a very large part of Australia are basically organised as two interconnected sets of matrimoity. So you make a primary division of the social universe into two halves. You, you always are in the same matrimoity as your mother. And then you zip down and go around a four generation cycle. <coughs> and then you marry across to the other matrimoity to particular positions. So you have uh, both of these things going on. Well, that particular pattern that we saw for Yulmo, uh, how widespread is it? But well, we can now go into that kin bank that we've been building over eight years now and say, well, how often does this occur in a thousand or so languages in kin bank? Uh, and so we can formulate questions about it so we can come up with an equation like a man's elder brother's son, uh, it is the same as a man's son, is a man's elder sister's son, does not equal, or, or just compare the father's elder brother's son, father's son, father's uh, elder sister's son. And then just see how the forms distribute over those. The one we're interested in is the red one. We could have different cars for each of them, but just for now we just give the red one. See where they're part. They're only in Australia. Uh, this understates the distribution. Uh, since preparing these slides, I've found another 10, 12, and there's undoubtedly more. And probably some of the ones in the south were covert or undetected ones because people didn't catch onto this early enough to ask uh, questions about it. But the, the main point is we only get that on this continent. Uh, and then that means that in this sort of welter of data that Kim Bank delivers us, we can do lots of things. We can carry out, you know, all sorts of scattergrams over the whole data and so on, but, and then we can just put each language as a point in that. But it's a bit hard to see what it is that puts the language in that point. So another visualisation tool that Simon Greenhill developed are these uh, star charts where you look at particular questions, like, for example, uh, one which as English speakers uh, you will recognize the little blue one or teal one maybe here that's the pattern the English pattern of siblings where you say a man's elder brother is the same as a man's younger brother is the same as a woman's younger brother is the same as a woman's older brother but different from ones with female reference look where they are they're just in Indo-European in Uralic in Athabascan uh, and in Afroasiatic, so the northern third of Africa or something. And each one of those slices of the pizza is a different question about 
uh, the kinship system. So we're going to look a lot more, but it's a way of visualizing the data and going in to see what's going on. And just the last point I want to make is that uh, this visualization is not the same as a sort of statistical proof, it's just a way of looking into the data, but you can already see there's some very interesting patterns just by eyeballing it. So that top row are all Australian families, uh, Papanyuman and Nyulnyul and Tanki, Gunmibu and Mindi. There's still debate about whether these families are all ultimately related. Some people, like myself, think that they are. Some people think they're not. That's fine. That's an ongoing question. But you can see that in this space of how languages organise their kinship, there's something similar. They're not identical, but they're much more similar to each other than to anything else. And then just the next line down, the Yam and Palhaturi families, yep, uh, are very, very similar. And interestingly, Indo-European, Afro-Asiatic, like down into Africa, top half of Africa, Uralic, and across even into the Northern Americas are very similar. So there's some very deep patterns of resemblance. One of the goals we set ourselves in total that we haven't reached is to move toward a sort of global family tree of the world's languages. That's still a very long way off uh, for linguists. But this is one tool that we can use in moving towards this because it allows us to see these large scale patterns that would otherwise elude us. So I will stop there. I've already run a little over time, but thank you for your forbearance.